What makes a story powerful? What makes a news story credible and newsworthy? What makes a bulletin impactful, strong? And what makes an audience sit up, take note, and lean in? These are just some of the questions I was recently asked when I was asked, is there a formula for news? The request was for very much kind of a standard operating procedure, an SOP, if you like. And my response, of course, was instant. Of course there is a news formula. Of course there are unbreakable journalism rules, the basic fundamentals of our craft, ethical considerations, non-negotiables, and deal breakers. Because as we're discussing those every day in our newsrooms, we're also weighing up issues of sources, anonymity, public interest, or interesting for the public. We're asking ourselves questions daily and hourly about integrity, truth, authenticity, credibility, independence. That's where it starts, but it's certainly not where it ends. Because somewhere in the middle of all of that, in the midst of the tick box exercises, in the middle of the ticking of all of these formulaic approaches, somewhere in the middle of these formulaic approaches to people management, there is a different place, a different world. There is a different formula, a parallel world. This reminded me of a moment in the newsroom many years before when I was so desperately seeking a news formula. It was the August of 2008, and we had just killed a president. Yes, we had just killed a president, an entire president of a whole country. Zambia's Livy Wanawasa had been sick for some time, and he was rather ill in a Paris hospital, so rumors started to swirl about the fact that he wasn't doing well, and he'd taken a turn for the worst. So, what did we do? We do what journalists do. We made some calls. We made some calls, we tapped our sources, we really contacted our contacts to see how he was doing. One of those many calls was to a contact in the Zambian High Commission in Pretoria. And we asked them in a very Mark Twain kind of fashion if rumors of his death were greatly exaggerated or if they were indeed true. We can't comment, said the voice on the other line, but we'll let you know if anything changes. Remember those words. We'll let you know, they said. A little while later, the phone in the newsroom rang. Levi Mwanawasa is dead, said the voice on the other end. He's dead, yelled the reporter. He's dead, repeated the news desk. He's dead, said I. Our trusted sources had called us back, and now we had a world exclusive. So what did we do in that moment? We broke the story. The Reuters monitor flashed a big headline that said, Zambia's Mwanawasa dead, report. Now, not only did we break the story, but the world knew that we had a world exclusive. And of course, you can imagine the newsroom in that moment is just filled with adrenaline and with action. It was then that the phone rang again. And the reporter who'd originally taken that first call suddenly went pale. And I watched him walking up to me. It was frantic and slow all at the same time. And he said the words that no editor wants to hear. They say it's not dead. He's not dead, he stumbled. They say Mwanawasa has not died. What? No, how, what? A journalist's worst nightmare. Those are not the words you want to hear. And so I decided to conjure up my long forgotten and very broken French and call the Paris hospital myself. Dead, dead, dead. What is the French word for dead? My brain now scrambling to think what to do. I finally got hold of a nurse on the other end in Paris. Dead, dead, mort. That's it. Mort. Le président est il mort. That's what I'll ask. Of course, I've got images now of my French high school teacher dancing in my brain, mocking me for not paying closer attention to her during class. I get the nurse on the other line and I ask her, Le président est il mort? 
silence. I repeat, le président est il mort? No, she says abruptly. No, and puts down the phone. What does she mean, no? I don't understand no right now. Why is it necessary for the French to be, well, so French? My blood went cold in that moment because I understood there and then that we were wrong. Facts matter. You see, truth matters no matter what. We'd broken the news on air. We broke the story on radio. And in that process, we'd literally broken the news. We broke the formula. So what's the formula for when you break the formula? In the chaos that unfolded in the newsroom in that moment, everybody looking to me for answers. What do we do? How do we do it? What's next? I just went still. I went still and left the newsroom. I literally walked out. I walked out onto the balcony, the Santon Street in front of me. I blocked out everything, not a sight, not a sound. In that moment, my world went still. And I leaned deeply and intuitively into myself. Breathe, breathe, think, listen, breathe, think, listen, lead. Make a call, make a decision, just decide, lead. I walked back into the newsroom strong and resolute and decided we needed to do the only thing that was right. Own it, accept, accept responsibility, and take full accountability. So we said we're sorry. We apologized to the president, to the people of his country. We apologized to his family, to our radio listeners whose trust we had broken. And we said sorry. It was a series of tragic missteps. A mischievous call to a newsroom far, far too eager to be first. There were too many unticked news boxes, and we had broken the formula. But in accepting responsibility, it was our way of then getting it right. It was our way of dealing with a formula that had been broken and leaning deeply and intuitively into myself in that moment hugely assisted me. I've often thought about that and I've beat myself up about that for many, many years. And I've come to realize it's not our mistakes that define us. It's our actions in the immediate aftermath. It's what we do, what we say, how we say it, how we do it, how genuine we are. That's what will define us, not what brought us to our knees. Fast forward to the September of 2020. A mere two months ago, South Africa had just started to come out of lockdown and we were really feeling that we could put sanitizers, masks, lockdown and online learning behind us. It was a beautiful Sunday morning. My husband, my younger son and I decided we would take a walk. My elder son stayed home to do a project for school the next day. It was also the very first time in a long time that we had felt healthy enough to do it. You see, the three of us, a mere two and a half months before that, had become numbers. Numbers in the national and global statistics. For we too had tested positive for COVID-19. One of the many, many, many millions. It was mild for the most part, and we were grateful. COVID-19, if you think about it, has been with us for an entire year. December marks a year. Let that sink in. And in that time, as we all think about the eerie silence of our streets, driving through the Joburg streets on day one of level five, I had a permit so I could. Such an eerie moment. How odd it was for us to be watching journalists in South Africa and across the globe reporting live from news stories with masks on. 
each and every one of us have felt that sense of unreal life that we are living. How could it be? Almost as if it was in a movie. So on that Sunday morning, there was nothing more normal to us than taking a long walk. We all craved normality. Until, until a white C-class Mercedes-Benz sped up in front of us and a tall masked man marched out and held us up at gunpoint. He was aggressive and we were afraid. He demanded everything and so we gave it to him. In fact, I was wearing a gold chain and I remember thinking that logically I must have tugged so hard that I broke the clasp off the back. But in that moment, it felt like I was picking up a feather, an angel's feather off my neck. It was absolutely effortless. I will forever remember the <coughs> sound of his gun. And I hadn't taken my eyes off my little boy the entire time. But right then, I felt him tremble, start to shake beside me. And he started to whimper. He started to give us these heavy sighs, whimpering from fear. This brave child who just a few months ago was in another COVID-19 battle with us. This little soldier was now fighting another battle with us. In that moment, my world stood completely still. And I leaned deeply and intuitively, without even realizing it, into myself. Breathe, breathe. Think, listen, and lead. I instinctively took my hand and covered his eyes, not wanting him to see anything, not the glare of the crime, not the cruelty of the moment in front of him. And I slowly led him away, the whole time whispering, it's fine, it's fine, you are fine, you're okay, we're okay. That move was risky and dangerous. They tell you not to move, the experts that is. They tell you to stay completely still in the face of danger like that. And what we did was risky. There was a trained, there was a loaded gun trained on my husband still. But we broke the formula. We broke the formula in that moment. So the question that needs to be asked is what's the formula for when you break the formula? We went for ice cream. Yep, that's right. We went for ice cream. Just hours after it had happened, I piled my fragile and still furious family into the car and insisted that we go for chocolate ice cream, insisting that we continue along the journey that we'd started that morning when we were so rudely and abruptly interrupted. My little one, still afraid and still traumatized from that incident, asked if he could take a weapon. And I said, sure, and nonchalantly handed him a pair of kitchen scissors. I had no idea if what I was doing was right or wrong. But I knew we had to go for ice cream. We're often faced with life's harrowing moments and we grapple with these questions so often in all of our lives, asking what is the formula, especially when the formula has been broken? What's the formula for surviving COVID-19? What's the formula for being in lockdown and staying sane? What's the formula for South Africa's devastating crime rate? What's the formula for staying alive when looking down the barrel of a gun? What is the formula when you are living inside a new cyclone? What's the formula when you need to lead teams who are looking to you for answers in times of crisis? 
and when your French has failed you? What is the formula to good health, strong relationships, raising good and kind, decent children? What is the formula to life? The answer, I think, is far closer than we could ever anticipate. And if we take that moment to lean deeply and intuitively inside of ourselves, we'll find the answer lies within us because there is no scientific method. There is no tick box exercise. There is no SOP and there surely is not a single person handing you a document in a time of crisis and telling you how to behave, what to do, what to say, where to go. It's not there. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's quite the opposite because it lies within us. It's a very intuitive part of us, a deep knowledge, a profound wisdom that if we are quiet enough to just listen to, we'll be able to tap into. Our country, our world, our teams, our families, those, those people closest to us need leadership now more than ever. And if we can find within us leadership that is empathetic, thoughtful, thoughtful heartfelt, intuitive, decisive, gutsy, then we are crafting our own formula. We speak about news, we speak about newspapers, we speak about radio news, television news. It is so full of harrowing stories, our stories, because people make those bulletins. So in that moment, when your world is standing still, and it doesn't matter why, it doesn't matter what has brought your world to a complete standstill, in that moment, lean deeply and intuitively into yourselves. And I truly believe you will find your formula. Thank you.